there, my name is Natalie of the Alternative Belgium History Channel and in this video I want to tell you which historical buildings you can definitely not miss when you visit Bruges if you are of course a history lover like I am. So when people think of Bruges these are the kind of images that usually come to mind. It's a charming place, a lot of picturesque buildings, romantic getaway with your partner. It's also called Venice of the North so a lot of canals, old bridges etc. But it's so much more than uh, some kind of medieval Disneyland because each of those historical buildings also has a, has a story, has an important history behind it, has played a role in the medieval history of Bruges in its golden age as a powerful and very wealthy European city. The entire historical center has been declared World UNESCO Heritage, so all of these buildings of course have some historical value, but there's of course only so much that you can do in a day or in two days or even in three days. So let me tell you which of these historical buildings you definitely cannot miss when you visit Bruges and of course if you love history. The first one is practically impossible to miss. It's the most important landmark of Bruges. It's the Belfort. All Belforts in Flanders are declared World UNESCO Heritage as a category, as a class of building, so not just the Bruges one. Its historical significance cannot be overrated. It was the symbol of the medieval city, of its autonomy, its privileges, its rights. The bigger the Belfort, the more powerful, the more wealthy a city. So in this case, size really did matter. It was the guard tower of the city from the top, as you can imagine very high tower. The guards had a great view, not only of the city itself, so they could see if there was a fire in, uh, somewhere in the city, but also beyond the city walls to see enemies approaching, for instance. It was and is also the bell tower, but in the Middle Ages it had important function to let people know when their day of work uh, or the curfew started or ended. They did not have watches at the time, of course. The bell fort had one more very important function and it was the treasury of the city and when I say treasure don't think of gold or jewelry but at that time it was documents parchments uh, documents that were priceless for the city it was its charter so the recognition of its status as a city and documents also establishing their rights their privileges if those documents were lost they lost the status of the city they lost their rights they lost their privileges so you can imagine it was their biggest treasure while the Belfort was the symbol of the city, of its autonomy, the city hall was the actual place uh, from which the city was governed for more than 600 years until today. Bruges City Hall is one of the oldest city halls of the Low Countries, Low Countries, Netherlands, Belgium today. The city hall of Bruges was built on a very symbolic location because it's where the fortress of the Counts of Flanders, the first fortress of the Counts of Flanders was located one of the three original settlements that later grew to become the city of Bruges. An absolute masterpiece is the Gothic Hall on the first floor, with its impressive folds and its early 20th century murals depicting the history of Bruges and of Flanders. In my opinion, citizens of Bruges are so lucky to have their civil wedding in this beautiful setting. <clears throat> This palace was the residence of one of the most successful and wealthy Bruges merchants during its golden age, Grut Huse. That is quite obvious if you see the picture here of his palace, of his residence. Why was he so wealthy? Why was he so powerful? It is because he had a monopoly. He had a monopoly on what is was called Gret, and Gret is a herbal mixture that was used in the Middle Ages instead of hops to brew beer. He had a monopoly on that for all of Flanders, so you can imagine how powerful and how wealthy he became. And this extreme power and wealth can be seen from a very special feature of his uh, personal palace, of his personal residence. His residence is connected, is directly connected to the church next door, the Church of Our Lady. Not just any church, but the church with the second highest brickwork tower, so quite an impressive and a monumental church and he literally did not have to step outside to attend mass because he had his private chapel in the, in the chancel of the church and that could be reached from his own house so he literally doesn't have to step outside to attend mass those are the most vip seats that ever existed in my opinion this way he didn't even have 
to mingle with the common wealthy or with the common rich people. So there are still about 27 churches in, in, in Bruges, but not all of them are actively used for worship anymore. But I picked this one. I picked the Basilica of the Holy Blood as the one you can't miss. Not because it's more beautiful than the others, it is actually not, but because of its historical value. What makes this probably one of the most important building, if not the most important religious building of Bruges, it's the Bruges version of the Holy Grail. It's a relic of the holy blood of Jesus Christ, which is supposedly brought to Bruges by its then count uh, Thierry of Alsace after the Second Crusades. He got it as a gift. So this is back in the 12th century. This, of course, this story is not confirmed and it's very unlikely even that it happened exactly this way. But that is the legend, that is a story. And every year on Ascension Day until today, the relic is carried around the city in a procession, the procession of the Holy Blood. So this has happened actually every year since the 14th century, with of course some breaks like Covid crisis, but also world wars, etc. Even today, it's still the most important day of the year in Bruges. So St. John's Hospital is one of the oldest hospitals in the world, with a history of more than 800 years already. It was first mentioned back in the 12th century. It was here that monks and especially nuns did the real job, cared for pilgrims, travelers, the poor, the sick. With the next one, we stay with the majority of the medieval population, the poor. It's especially for those most vulnerable in society. Even in the golden age of Bruges, it was a very tough time. So luckily, charity was an essential part of Catholic faith in those days. The rich tried to buy their spot into heaven through charity. For instance, building and maintaining almshouses. That's kind of a public or social housing, en voilà lettre. From the 14th century onwards, these sets of small white houses for the elderly or for widows, they started popping up everywhere around Bruges. There was a condition though, in return for living in these houses, the women that lived there had to pray for the donor family every day. And it, that is why that these sets of Elms houses always have a chapel where the occupants of the Elms houses would be expected to send their prayers of thanks up to heaven. Nowadays, there are still 46 Elms houses in the city center. They have been, of course, carefully restored and they have been carefully modernized as well, uh, but they still have basically the same function as before. It's housing for the most vulnerable in society, social or public housing. This next one is a personal favorite of mine. It's the Beguinage. Beguinages in general are, again, another typical aspect of Flemish heritage, UNESCO World Heritage, as a class, as a kind of building, including the Beguinage, of course, of Bruges. What are Beguinages? You might not even have heard this name before. Beguinages were close communities of very religious laywomen. Beguins were not nuns, so they did not make eternal vows, they didn't have to live in poverty, but they were a very special kind of religious community, very religious community, and they lived together in a Beguinage. Men were not allowed inside. Just like all medieval cities, Bruges used to have a city wall and gates. As in many other medieval cities, the city wall has unfortunately largely disappeared. But four city gates have survived in Bruges, even though they've changed, of course, a lot over the centuries. But they still give you a bit of an idea of how this city defense must have looked like a few centuries ago. Many foreign merchants settled permanently in Golden Age Bruges, and the Adorne family was one of them. Their city residence is one of the most authentic Golden Age sites you can visit, as it actually hasn't changed too much since the late Middle Ages. And especially its church, called the Jerusalem Church, inspired by the tomb of Christ in Jerusalem, really catches the eye. It's a bit away from the main touristic area and therefore a lot less busy as well, which of course adds to its authenticity. What is now het Van Eyckplein or the Van Eyck Square used to be the most important port area of Bruges. The river was overarched, was vaulted and is gone, but this used to be a port area with a bridge. The old toll house is a reminder of that. It was the place where arriving merchants had to go and pay tolls on the goods and the products of both regional and international trade. On the left hand side of this building, there's the Panders house, often referred to as the narrowest building in Bruges. 
This was the meeting place of the panders. Those were the dock workers that worked to load and unload the ships. You should also check the details of the facade. It's great. You can see the panders or the dock workers at work. And last but not least, of course, is het beursplein. Or if I translate literally, that would be the stock exchange square. In Bruges' golden age and beyond, merchants gathered here on this square every day to conduct several types of exchange transactions. It is often called the oldest stock exchange in the world. It's not exactly historically correct. It was a precursor though. It was a necessary innovation, a first step towards the first stock exchange in Antwerp of the 16th century. So a little bit later. Very important place in the history of our global economic system for sure. The current words for stock exchange in most European languages are derived from the name of the square, the Beurs in Dutch, but also Bolsa in Spanish, Bourse in French, Beurze in German, etc. And even in English, English in this case is not an exception, it used to have a word, Beurs, that was used for exchange or stock exchange before the Royal Exchange was used in the UK. Now this is of course a non-exhaustive list and maybe even slightly subjective. Please let me know in the comments if you have any other favorite historical building in Bruges. If you like to learn more about Bruges, its history and of other places in Belgium, subscribe to my channel and you won't miss any upcoming videos. Thank you.